Dr. Frankel, what is the difference between people who are able to pick themselves up, get over life's problems, and those who are not? The decisive factor is decision, the freedom to, of choice, the freedom to come up with a decision. It should be, I would like to become this way or another in spite of conditions that should only seem to fully determine my behavior. I wish to act freely as a responsible being, which is a human being. I wish to act in accord with heredity and environment, using, owing what I become to them, but also if need be, in spite of the worst conditions. That, this is exactly what you could watch and witness under severe extreme conditions of, strength, of, of stress or of uh, or tragic conditions. Just think of uh, people uh, living for several years under the worst conditions of prisoner of war camp. There is a whole body of, of, uh, of psychiatric literature about that, or for that matter, in concentration camps. And this is what should be acknowledged. People are free, and if you watch or study the lives of such people in just a detached, down-to-earth, empirical, strictly empirical, scientific way and fashion, other, in another way than you presented it and you commented it in another way, then people get the picture, the impression of a human being as something, not someone, something that is fully determined, whereas they don't recognize and acknowledge the freedom and the responsibility, the responsibility for themselves, the responsibility for making something or someone out of himself. So your basic philosophy is that life has meaning under all conditions, but how easy is it when there's a sense of hopelessness, a sense of despair, to recognize this meaning? Let me present you, confront you with a somewhat uh, strange definition of despair. As I'm used to uh, proclaiming is that despair uh, can be explained in terms of a mathematical equation. D, capital D, equals S minus M. What does it mean? Despair is suffering without meaning. As long as an individual cannot find, cannot see any meaning in his or her despair, he or she will certainly be prone to, in its suffering, I wanted to say, no meaning in the suffering. He or she will, uh, her will certainly be prone to despair and, under certain conditions, to suicide. But at the moment they can see a meaning in their suffering, they can mold it into an achievement, into a, they can mold their predicament into an accomplishment on the human level. They can turn their tragedies into a personal triumph but they must know for what, what should I do with it. But if people like so many segments of present day society and population cannot find any meaning whatsoever in their lives, cannot see anything meaningful, they more often than not have uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, something to live by, uh, or say at least enough to live by, they cannot see anything to live for. What is the answer to the question, why me? Why did this happen to me? The uh, answer to such a question is nothing that a psychiatrist or any other type of a scientist <coughs> can come up. But I would not uh, share the opinion of, say, Jean Paul Sartre, who said we have to accept and uh, to shoulder courageously, heroically, the absolute meaninglessness of our lives. But what I think is rather that what we have to accept is the incapacity of uh, 
our, uh, of our humanness, the incapacity to recognize the ultimate meaning in intellectual or merely rational terms. This is the only thing we have to accept. But still, we may believe in, a, in ultimate meaning, but to, to uh, lead someone, say a patient, to, uh, to eat the way for him to such a belief, to faith, is of course not the business or job to be carried out by a psychiatrist, but rather by a theologian. Tell me, to what extent do you feel we have choices in the things that befall us? Our freedom is a finite freedom, a limited freedom. That is to say, a human being is never fully free from conditions, be they of biological or psychological or sociological uh, kind. But the ultimate freedom is always and remains always reserved to ourselves. That is the freedom to take a stand to whatever conditions might confront us. How we react to the unchangeable conditions is up to ourselves. In other words, if we cannot change a situation, we have always the last freedom to change our attitude to that situation. Dr. Frankel, give me an example of meaning that can be taken out of a situation of despair. I once received a letter from a young Taxan uh, student who told me his own story. At the age of 17 years, he had an accident when uh, indulging to his driving, uh, diving sport. And from that time on, he was paralyzed from the neck down. And he wrote to me, I broke my neck, but it did not break me. I am at present helpless, and this handicap will remain with myself apparently forever. But I have not given up my studies. I went because of my own helplessness to help other people. I want to become a psychologist to help others. And I'm sure, he wrote to me, that my suffering will add an essential contribution to my ability to understand others and to help other people. This man, three, three years later, was invited by me to deliver a lecture, to read a paper, at the third World Congress of Logotherapy taking place at the University uh, of Regensburg in West Germany. He was brought in and with his wheelchair by a plane from Texas to West Germany and delivered a lecture under the title The Defiant Power of the Human Spirit. And the last sentence read I know that this is true because that man was me. For a quarter of a century, I had uh, the honor to be the director of a neurological department at a general hospital. And believe me, throughout that time, I had ample opportunities to watch and witness how most uh, uh, even, uh, young people could master their fate uh, uh, young uh, uh, girls, for instance, that had uh, danced a week, uh, a weekend ag uh, before in a disco, then were paralyzed due to a brain tumor or uh, a tumor uh, of the uh, spinal cord, a neoplasma of the spinal cord, or how a young men uh, who the last weekend still were skiing in the Austrian Alps or driving their Yamaha 
uh, motorcycle, uh, could no longer uh, move a leg. And I've uh, seen people who were uh, amputated. All four extremities had to be taken away due a certain case, what I have in mind, due a, a, a high voltage, uh, voltage uh, electric uh, uh, incident, accident. And uh, I know that one told his, uh, his uh, former nurse from the husk of the hospital, he wrote to her letter, before this terrible accident, I was bored, always bored and always drunk. And since my accident, I know what it means to be happy, imagine, with no extremities. I know what it means to be happy. His life had become uh, full of happiness again, simply because as long as you are pursuing happiness, as the phrase uh, 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 reads, as long as you are aiming at happiness, you cannot obtain it. The more you make it tar a target, the more you, you miss the aim and you miss the target. This is uh, most conspicuous in cases of sexual neurosis, where exactly those people, male patients, who are striving to demonstrate their potency, they fall prey to impotence. The more a female patient tries to show to herself at least how much she is capable of experiencing a full female orgasm, the more she is doomed to frigidity. But at the moment you do not think of, of pleasure or happiness, but just you give yourself be it in sexual activities, be it in work, be it in love, at that moment that you are no longer concerned with becoming a happy or a successful man or a woman, at that moment happiness installs itself by itself. But Dr. Frankel, tell me, how could the people in the death camp at Auschwitz, and you were there yourself, what meaning could they take out of a absolutely hopeless situation. They knew they were going to die. What I can uh, uh, say about the lesson I took home from Auschwitz and Dachau and so forth, let me prefer to speak in a more uh, personally detached way by referring to the absolutely parallel experiences and experience that people had in prisoner war camps. The literature, psychiatric literature, in the field of psychiatry of uh, uh, POW camps shows independently from each other that psychiatrists found out that those inmates or prisoners were most likely to survive the camp period. Those, I say, who were orientated toward a future, orientated toward becoming free again in the future, and most importantly, oriented to a meaning that they had to fulfill in the future, a task that they had to complete in the future, and or to be reunited with their beloved people in the future again. Let me just uh, uh, recount an incident that happened to me in one of my own concentration camps. I was confronted uh, within a couple of days with two people, two comrades, the one of which I, of whom I knew that they are prone to suicide. Now what happened? I asked both why they wished to commit suicide to take their lives and without knowing independently from one another they told me, see doctor, I have nothing uh, to expect from my life anymore. And you know what I uh, improvisingly uh, ask them, now listen, isn't it conceivable that instead life expects something from you? And then it turned out that, that one of them was expected by his own daughter whom he loved above all, about all, uh, above all. In, in the United States she had already succeeded in emigrating. And the other then frankly told me and confessed that there, were that there was a series of books that he had uh, written and or edited in, in the field of geography, it was, as far as I remember, and he wanted to complete this series of books. And at that moment there was something like a Copernican reversal. Suddenly, 
they, uh, the scenery had uh, turned uh, 180 degrees around. Suddenly they saw they have to do something for the world and not waiting until the judgment is issued death or survival. But these very people had the highest chances to survive under equal circumstances, of course. What I mean is that millions had to die in the concentration camps, particularly in uh, Auschwitz, as you might know, and millions and uh, hundreds of thousands of them were certainly oriented toward a meaning, if for no other meaning, in religious terms. To, uh, and they had to die, as they would have said, uh, 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 the Kiddush Hashem, for the glorification of God, out of their own beliefs in the gas chambers. So even at the moment of death, they were able to take meaning right. out of that moment exactly. Exactly. of death. Exactly. You see, there is what I'm used to calling, uh, when speaking to my students, as the uh, tragic triad of human existence, consisting of pain, death, and guilt. Nobody is spared suffering from diseases, pain. No uh, one of uh, 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 us human beings uh, can uh, escape death, finally. And there is no one who uh, would, uh, could keep himself free from guilt. It is not possible. But always, as I put it uh, before, always suffering, uh, tragedy, can be turned into a triumph, into a human achievement. And as to death, it could well serve as an in, uh, incentive to to uh, responsible action, because unless we were mortal, imagine if we were uh, immortal, then we could postpone everything. There were no hurry, there were, there were no need to do something right now. But there is a wonderful word of an author who has uh, not written but said it about 2,000 years ago. You find it in the Bible. Uh, it is Hillel. H-I-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, who uh, once said, if I'm not doing it, who will do it? If I'm not doing it right now, when shall I do it? But if I'm doing it only for my own sake, what am I? This means no really human being. Because a human being is not someone as psychotherapeutic systems depict the human being. He is not someone he, that is concerned primarily and originally with uh, uh, complexes, conditions, conflicts, and problems going on within his psychological system, intrapsychically, as, as it were. But normally, fundamentally, originally, primarily, basically, any human being is concerned with something out there in the world, is concerned with someone out there in the world, a work to do, a job to complete, a task, a meaning, a mission in life waiting for him, for him exclusively to be materialized, to be actualized by him and by no other person right now. Who else if not he? And finally, this he doesn't do for himself, for his tranquility, for his uh, uh, discharge of tensions, for his uh, inner equilibrium, for getting rid of the stimuli, uh, the, uh, of the superego which uh, is dissatisfied, or uh, obeying the, uh, the father image. But he's doing it for the sake of a cause to serve or another person to love, and not and never and never for himself only. Thus, this is the, uh, what man can do. And imagine if he were not mortal, then he could postpone everything. There would not be the one-third, the second-third of Hitler's dictum. There would not be sense in the formulation when, uh, when if not now, because he's immortal. To get back to suffering and despair, sometimes it seems that some people seem to have a much heavier load than others. Do these people not feel after a while, can I still continue to take meaning? You wouldn't believe it. 
it comes to mind that there is a specific statistically, empirically, strictly empirical study that was published a couple of years ago by two famous psychologists. And it turned out by way of, stat uh, not only of statistics, but, but uh, by test batteries, that people prone to death who knew that they were, uh, they were dying soon had a higher sense of meaning than normal populations. And uh, if I tell you the story that uh, the dean of the School of Nursing at the University of Texas, in the Texas Medical Center in Houston, a famous center, she wrote me of a case of a young girl, very young girl, 17 years of age or so, who uh, was uh, paralyzed totally, also up to her neck, and could only, by use of a mouth stick, type letters. And uh, uh, Dean Stark, that nurse, uh, told me within a f three lines, I remember this letter, she told me that that girl is reading newspapers day by day, watching television, and as soon as she comes across an individual in a tragic life situation, she types with the mouth stick on the typewriter letters offering them consolation and comfort. And she has some credibility, believe me. And she, uh, the, uh, the dean, uh, Stark, say, uh, says she's full of confidence. She has a strong sense of abundant meaning in her life. While others who cannot see meaning under the best conceivable conditions take their lives because they are frustrated. They are caught in an existential vacuum, in a sense of meaninglessness and emptiness. I have described it in uh, a book of mine as soon as in 55. Since that time, it has ever more been increasing worldwide. You find you are, you are facing it not only in Western countries, you are facing it in the so-called uh, third world, you are facing it in uh, communist states and communist psychiatrists also describe it in, the, um, uh, in their literature what Frankl uh, tells us about uh, this uh, existential frustration is also observable in the communist countries they commit so are you conceivable. saying that in order to find meaning it is necessary to experience suffering I wouldn't say it is necessary to experience suffering. What I say is just that meaning can be found under each and every condition in life, even under the, uh, under the worst conceivable conditions, provided that it is a situation you cannot change. Remember, I said this explicitly. That means provided that there can, the cause of your suffering cannot be removed. If you can remove the cause of a suffering, say in case of a cancer, by surgery, you have to undergo surgery. If you are suffering from a severe uh, compulsive obsessive neurosis, you have to seek psychotherapeutic help. They are in, within the realm of uh, logotherapy, for instance, certain techniques that can be applied with uh, much success, as ha has been evidenced not by logotherapists, but by behaviorists. And finally, if you are confronted with, the social, with sociological conditions that have caused your suffering, then you are called upon to change the situation to remove the cause of your suffering by political action, for instance. 
But in this respect, I would like to make another uh, additional statement by telling you something that I, a couple of weeks ago, have, t have told my professors and students forming my audience at the Karl Marx University in uh, Moscow. I was invited by the prorector to uh, uh, stay there for a month and to lecture there on my teachings, but I had only time for uh, two uh, days. And I told them, don't think that I come, came to, he, to you from the West in order to sell you any political opinions. No. I don't come as a politician, but I speak to you an, on a meta-political level. This means that I recognize only, on a worldwide scale, only two styles of politics or two types of politicians. The one is he, the politician, who thinks that the end justifies the means, any means. While the second type remains fully aware that there are means that would desecrate even the most noble end. And they were applauding, they had an understanding. And so I don't come into any country with a preconceived political conviction. I'm not entitled to judge it. But I have the responsibility to accept any call wherever in the world to deliver a message if any should uh, be present and to, uh, to act as an MD, as a doctor of medicine. And as such, I had to take the Hippocratic Oath that compels me to try to offer a cure to each and every individual or also population well, if they invite me to do so. Dr. Frank, I'm going to ask you now, as you know, this country is going through a very difficult time. We have an economic recession. People have become insolvent or without jobs. The political future is far from settled. Do you have a message for us, a message that could give us hope and meaning? You see, the only message I can deliver is a principle that I have adapted, uh, um, adopted, excuse me. I have adopted, I well remember uh, throughout the days I had to spend in Auschwitz. Uh, there is statistical evidence that my chance to survive Auschwitz, really statistical evidence, was uh, uh, 29 to 1 and I had the feeling that it was like that and still I applied the philosophy of Sir Karl Popper which whose nucleus means that you cannot uh, uh, prove any hypothesis the only thing you can do is falsify it show that it is not valid, that it is not tenable. And without uh, knowing uh, his philosophy, I only met him the first time a couple of years ago, uh, I applied this theory in as much as I told myself, Victor, the chances are very, very low and small. Probably you will be uh, sent to the gas chamber and still there is nobody who can guarantee me and convince me with 100% certainty that I shall not survive but end in the gas chamber. As long as I have no guarantee that I will have to die within the next days, I continue behaving and acting as if I would spare this fate. Dr. Frankel, thank you.